the Lord gave me a message today about giving. And I want to share that with you today because giving is not just one-dimensional when, when it comes to giving to the Lord. And it, it is a, an incremental part of our journey with God and how important it is. And I want to show you today just how important it is. And I'm going to do my best not to bore you with that um, or, or maybe make you too emotional. You know, my wife and I, we were recently at a wedding and it was so emotional, that wedding, that even the cake had tears at it. And for that, you're welcome. <laughs> there you go. All righty. Somebody will get that one on the way home. I promise you, somebody's going to get that one on the way home. Sorry. Or I could have told you about how Noah's, Noah's favorite fruit was pears, right? Or No, that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> before we, hey, before we begin, I do want to, uh, I do want to show you, in case I don't do this later, this book that I'm holding right here, uh, some of what I'm speaking about today was actually pulled from this book also. Uh, this book is called The Treasure Principle, and it's written by Randy Alcorn. And years ago, Pastor Buddy actually showed this to the congregation and sure encouraged many of us to purchase this book. I'm sure you can probably get it on Amazon. It's, again, it's called The Treasure Principle, and it's by Randy Alcorn. Awesome, awesome book on biblical giving. So I want to promote that really quickly today in case I forget to do that later. All right. Giving. Title of today. Oh. It, did I? I don't see a red light. Oh, it's that one. Sorry. There we go. Got it. Got a red light. Boom. Giving. All in. All in. God's order of giving. I want to tell you something today. What the, and this is... Well, I've studied this out, and not only have I studied this, but my wife and I have applied this to our finances. So what I'm telling you today is completely scriptural, completely biblical, and not only that, but we've practiced it and proved that it works. So I just want to caveat today's sermon with that, that this works, and this is exactly what God's called us to do. So first of all, let's talk about giving. And what giving involves. Giving can involve our time. Giving can involve service. However, today we're going to be talking about financial giving. What it means. And this, can we just clear the air today that the, the, the elephant in the room about churches, and it's not in this church, but you'll hear it just a, a status quo about church. Oh, the church just wants your money, right? And you hear that. I'm sure many of you have heard that. And it's hogwash. And honestly, there may be some churches out there that may be money hungry, but I can guarantee you today, as the treasurer of Tower City Church, Tower City Church is not after your money. I can promise you that, and I mean that sincerely. Tower City Church has, we have an incredible team in this church on the financial task force who you will meet later today, who sees to it that we are absolutely in line and biblically moving with our finances in this church, right? And you're going to see that later again. However... Financial giving, what does it involve? Obviously, it involves money. And we're just going to start very simply today. And let's just talk about what money is. Because God talks about in the Bible how the love of money, right? If we have the love of money, that's, that's not what we want. And it's nothing about having the love of money. But money simply is nothing more than a tool. That's all it is. It is a piece of paper. It is something that you see nowadays on an electronic device, maybe, that belongs to you, right? And I put that in quotations. Money is nothing more than a tool. And what God cares about is the way we manage that tool. So you should never be in love or allow a tool to control your life. Money should never control your emotions. Money should never control your relationships. Nothing about that. Money is nothing more than a tool and how we manage it matters. And let me give you an analogy. A knife, right? A knife is also a tool. And if I use a knife properly... A knife can bring great things into my life. I can multiply with that knife. I can prune things with that knife. Planting. I can prepare my food with that knife. But if I use that knife improperly, it can bring death and destruction. The exact same thing with money. If I use money properly and I manage it properly, it will bring fruition and multiplication to my life. But if I use it improperly, it will bring death and destruction to my life as well. Does that make sense? And that is so simple and is so true. So I want to share with you today, um, just practical, the, the Bible is so simple 
about giving. And this scripture right here, you're very familiar with most all of these scriptures today, but this is Matthew 6.33. And it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, And all these things will be added unto you. It's not read on the screen, but that's read in your Bible when you read it. Because Jesus himself said that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I gave you, that's King James, New King James. Another version in here is the New Century Version. Look what it says. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants. Then all your other needs will be met as well. But the key is, is you have to seek first. Because you'll never get second, third, or fourth until you seek first. Right? And if I try to go get the second, third, and fourth without seeking first, I'm never going to get the second, third, and fourth. I'm going to be chasing my tail my whole life. And how many people, and I'm telling you guys, today, what I'm giving you is something that I have lived. Because for many years, I chased my tail financially. And I lived paycheck to paycheck. And I could never get ahead until God showed me how to do this. And he is a giver, and he wants us to mimic that character of giving, correct? So seek first. Seek first. That is the number one thing. Seek first God's kingdom. So when I am doing this and I'm applying this to my life, I have to understand that I have to seek this first. What is the goal? What is the goal of giving? And I, I, I had to ask that to God. What is the goal? I do that often with my life. I ask, Okay, let me step back from what I'm looking at right now, whether this be work-related. You know, Pastor Buddy and I, I'm going to jump here real quick. We meet every other week as the leaders of the church, and we just talk about the things of the church. We seek God about the house and whatnot. And I remember it was about a year ago right now. And I had to just point blank ask him. I said, you know what? I said, what is the goal of us meeting on a Sunday morning in the church? What does is, what is a successful Sunday morning look like to us? What would we call success on a Sunday morning? What's the goal? You know what his answer was? I was oh, the presence of God. As long as we have the presence of God in the house of the Lord, that is a successful service on a Sunday morning. Amen? And thank God we have pastors who think that way. Boy, that is awesome. So what's the goal? What's the goal? And who is the ownership of money? Is it really mine? Or is it really God's? Now, the Sunday school answer is it belongs to God, right? But do I live like it belongs to God? Or do I live like it belongs to me? Because you can say it with your mouth, but your heart can speak it completely different. And that's what this book talks a lot about, actually. Right? Because the Lord says also in the Bible that where your treasure lies, there your heart lies also. And your heart's going to follow. And I've heard heard many people say this, leader, uh, biblical leaders in my life, all you have to do is look at a person's checkbook to see where their heart is. If your checkbook was fully exposed for everybody to see, would it show where your heart is? Yes, it would. But would you be willing to show that? And you're going to see it today because you're pretty much going to see the checkbook of Tower City Church later today in the finance meeting. You'll see this is where the heart of the church is, right? Let me tell you something. When it comes to money and debt... (laughs) If the U.S. government would give to the work of the Lord, do you know how quickly our national debt would go like that? It's true. Absolutely true. Now, that is an amount of money that we can't even fathom when we're talking trillions of dollars, right? But I'm telling you what, if if this would be applied to every single part of our life, including our nation, amazing debt release. And I'm going to show you today how the Lord will get you out of debt if you will simply apply it to your life. Secondly, let me just say this before we get into these practical ways of giving. And I want to say this right. We don't, when we give to the Lord, we don't just tip God. We should not just tip God with our finances. And the Lord gave me this awesome, awesome saying. If I tip God, I'm treating him like my waiter instead of my master. Is he my waiter or is he my master? Because, and I told you, I used to live a certain way. And God showed me that a long time ago. You know what? Back when I was that way, when you would add up at the end of the year how much money you've given to a waiter at a restaurant... Was that even close to what you had given to the Lord for a year? I just recently did our family taxes. And that's a great time where I just look over everything we've done. I say, okay, Lord, where are we? 
Where are we, right? That's a great time for you to do that, to look at, okay, where's my heart? Where am I giving right here? And let me say this too. Tower City Church doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money, (laughs) right? But he calls us to do it because he wants to increase us. He wants to bless you. That's why he calls you to do this. Did you know that one of the first things, what is one of the first things God said to man on the earth? Be fruitful and multiply. That goes to all levels of life, whether it be your family, whether it be your health, whether it be your finances even. Be fruitful and multiply. Okay. Enough introduction. (laughs) I said to you earlier, giving is not one-dimensional. Oftentimes we can think of giving, and many of you have probably heard me say this. I, I gave a sermon somewhat like this years ago, and it's more of a teaching than anything. But giving is, is it's not just tithe, in other words, when I say one-dimensional. There's more than just the tithe, and we're going to talk about each one of these types of giving today. There is four, actually, and we'll dig into each one of those four. But if we start to study these and learn these, and it's good, and you know, God... God Forgives ignorance, right? Because if we just don't know, we don't know. But after today, you can't make the excuse you don't know necessarily. (laughs) And we're going to look through some scriptures today, and I want to show you these today. And we're going to start in uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Many of you are probably very familiar with this scripture. And the first type of giving, obviously, that we're going to talk about is the most talked about giving when it comes to giving to the Lord, and that is our tithe, which is 10%. That is what tithe means, one-tenth, 10%. It's very simple. In the voice, this uh, version of the Bible, I want to I want to uh, uh, read it out of here and look what it says. It says to rectify this situation, you must bring the entire tithe into the storage house in the temple. Okay, stop. Where is the storage house? Where is the temple? The temple is the house of the Lord that I belong to. I want to make that very clear because many times people will say, well, I give my tithe to that church, but I go to this church. That is not biblical. God called you to give your tithe to the local church that you belong to, your storage house and your temple, so that there may be food for me, says the Lord, right? The M is capitalized for me and for the Levites in my house. Let me ask you a quick question to stop right there. Who are the Levites? The pastors, right? The tribe of Levi, right? The Levites are your pastors. So you understand, I bring a tenth of what I earn, my income, to the house, to my local church that I belong to, for the church and for the pastors of the church. Let's move along. Feel free to test me in this now. See whether or not I, who is I, the eternal commander of heavenly armies. You're not dealing with your local president of the bank down the street right here. The eternal commander of heavenly armies, God Almighty, will open the windows of heaven to you, pour a blessing down upon you until all your needs are satisfied. That's in the Bible. Now, I can receive that for what it says because it's in the Bible. Now, the part of the problem (laughs) <laughs> and I know I'm hitting some things really hard today, but part of the problem is some people will give one time. They'll give a tenth. Boom. I'll give a tenth. And maybe they'll give twice. Maybe they'll give three. I'll give it. No, it didn't work. And I pull back because I feel like I, I, I'm better at managing this, God. I, can't, I cannot afford to do this. And can I clear the air on something else today too? Do I give on the net? Do I give on the gross? <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> Terry said something. A few weeks ago on a Wednesday night that I thought was so, I'm pretty sure it was on a Wednesday night. So profound. And I don't even know how it got brought up. But Terry simply said something, and I believe she had heard it somewhere once, that if you give on the net or you give on the gross, you can give on the net, but you're going to have holes in your finance, just like a net. And things are going to seep through that God intended for you to have that are going to, you're going to lose out on. Because every single type of giving we're going to talk about today has a motivation behind it, but it also has a rate of return. And I know those rate of return is kind of a financy type type word, but rate of return means if if I give this, what do I get back? What percentage do I get back if I give this? 
how does this work in my favor, in other words? Now, listen, I also said they have a motivation. So in other words, my motivation for giving on every type of giving is not to get back. That is never my motivation when it comes to giving. And if it is, just can, I'll tell you the best way to do this. Just continue to give faithfully and obediently, and that motivation will start to change. At first, you may, and I'm guilty. Again, guys, I am completely guilty. I started giving so that I could get. But God even says, I believe it's in the book of Luke. Um, Don't quote me, but I think it's around chapter 6 or something. Jesus even says, look, don't be so consumed with getting because of your giving. The Lord in heaven wants to give you the very kingdom himself, right? Don't be so consumed with that. So in other words, they have a motivation, and they also have a rate of return. Now, the motivation behind tithing... There's kind of really two here. And the first one, I'm going to kind of flip these. I had these one way, but the first one really is honor. That's why I give my tithe is out of honor to the Lord. And the second one is out of obedience to the Lord. And let me tell you what I mean by that or why I put them in that order. Because honestly, I had them flip-flopped. I had obedience and I had honor. But if you look back in Genesis chapter 14, it's in verse 20. Now, I don't have it on the screen, but you can mark that. In Genesis chapter 14, you can just read the whole chapter, and you can really get lost in that chapter. Um, But this is where uh, Abraham, it's actually Abram, it's not even Abraham at the time. Abram goes to rescue Lot, because all these kings, they're fighting each other, they're killing each other, and they go and they steal all the spoil from Sodom and Gomorrah, and this was before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, obviously. They go steal everything. Abraham has to go rescue Lot, because they stole Lot as well. So Abraham, Abram goes and rescues his nephew, nephew Lot. He takes his 300-some-odd men, right? And they go out, they rescue Lot, and he kills them, gets Lot back, and gets all the spoil that they took from them also, right? Well, when Abram comes back, he gives to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, but he was also the priest of Salem. And I should have had these. I apologize for not having this on the screen. But anyways, Abram... Gave Melchizedek a tenth in Genesis 14, 20. It says, Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. When did God ever tell anybody in the Bible to give a tenth of what you have before Abram gave that tenth to Melchizedek? He didn't. God never said that to anybody yet in the Bible. He never said. Not until Deuteronomy does it become law to give a tenth. Abram did this out of honor. So that's why we put honor before obedience when we're giving our tithe. I do this out of honor to the Lord. Because Abram also is a a, 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 a picture, a a, a symbol of what God is like, right? He is the father. He, he, He took Isaac, and Isaac is like a Jesus, right, that was sacrificed. So Abram is showing an example. God is showing through Abram here. This is exactly how I exude my character. This is how I intend for you to exude your character. This is an honor thing. Now, later in Deuteronomy is when God is setting the law and says, give it, bring a tenth and give a tenth, right? So what is the motivation of tithe? It is honor. I simply just honor, but it's also out of obedience because God did put it into law, correct? Now, the rate of return on tithe, what is the rate of return? Well, it's right here. It says, I will open the windows of heaven to you and pour a blessing down on you until all your needs are satisfied. So what's the rate of return for a tithe? The rate of return, what I get back if I tithe, is open windowed heaven. (laughs) Whoop-de-doo. What does that mean? I get complete, total access to God. Now, what he also said, and that, and I may have it. Let me see if I have it. Yeah. I didn't even finish the statement or the the scriptures. I will rebuke the swarm of locusts devouring your crops. And the devourer will not cause the produce you have grown in the earth to decay or the vines of the fields to drop their grapes. So for the rate of return, if I tithe, if I give one-tenth of my income to the Lord, to the work of the Lord, to my storehouse, to my pastors, I get open-windowed heaven and God is going to rebuke the devil for my sake. In other words, all of my assets are covered. My car, my home, I don't care what it is. And I'll tell you right now, if the, 
there's many places in the Bible you can read something here and you can read something later, way down maybe in the New Testament, and see it, oh, that relates to that back there, right? So, in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking about if the thief is caught, right? He has to pay you back seven times plus the substance of his household. So if the enemy's trying to steal from you when you're tithing your money and you're being faithful and you have that open window to heaven and God is rebuking the devourer, in other words, the enemy from your finances for your sake, and he's still trying to steal from you, uh-uh. That doesn't apply. That is not allowed. Because you're caught out now. I am being faithful. I am being honorable. I am being obedient. And you are not allowed to steal from me. Therefore, if you steal from me, I get seven times what you just stole from me. And I get your furniture. Thank you. Right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, I want, I want to make that really clear about the tithe. Because obviously it's, it's the most basic one. It's the one we know. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But I do want to make sure that we understand the, the concept of the motivation behind it. That it is, it is honor and it is obedience. Those are my motivations of why I simply tithe. Right? The second type of giving... I'm going to give you a little bit of a math lesson today, too. <laughs> but the second type of giving is first fruits giving. First fruits giving is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. And I'm going to give it to you right here. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay. Let's study this out. And I told you I've studied this a lot. And we've applied it too. What does this mean? Honor the Lord with your possessions. Possessions is what I own. That's what I have, right? What I possess. That's what I own. I'm going to honor God with everything I own. My home. My vehicle. Everything I do. My body. Right? I am honorable with. Now also, with the first fruits of all your increase. Let me, this is where the math lesson comes in. What is a first fruit and how do I apply a first fruit simply to my life? If I work at a job, I have my income that I make. I tithe off the gross on that income. A year later, and this could be more than a year later or less, but often companies will give you a cost of living increase or some type of a merit increase, some type of a raise, in other words, right? I get that raise. 3%. I get a 3% pay increase. The first time I get that pay increase, I give every bit of that increase to God. The first time I received it. That is a first fruit. The first of my increase. Does that make sense? My wife and I apply this. I have a, I'm a financial geek. I have a calculator and a spreadsheet all set up that already knows. Hey, every time I get it, this is how much we're doing. You know? And I tell her. I give... The first time I receive that pay increase, I give every bit of, I give my tithe off the new amount, and I also give all of that new amount that I'm making of the increase of what I made on top of the other. In other words, if I will say you make $100 a week, now I'm making $150 a week. Well, I'm tithing $15 because that's 10% of my $150, plus I'm giving $50 on top of the $15 because that's more than what I made the last time. Does that make sense, right? Okay, that's how a first fruit works. It's not hard. It's very simple. Right now, what is the motivation or the reason I give my first fruits? It's basically generosity. It shows God, you know what? You can trust me with money. God says, yep, if I see you give me the first, I know I can trust you with money. It's how I get increase in my life more. One of the ways I get increase in my life. But if I look now, what's the rate of return? In other words, what do I get back if I give my first fruits? Well, let's see what it says again right here. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Let's break this down. Barns. Barns are uh, things that hold, or silos, things on farms that hold, <laughs> I'm going to say this word, containable commodities. Huh? Things that you need. Thank you, Donna. Food. What you need to live off of. Containable commodity. That's what a barn holds, Right? So your barns will be filled with plenty. In other words, everything you need is always going to be full. You're always going to have food in your refrigerator. You're always going to have gas in your gas tank. God is going to see to it that your checkbook's never at zero. Your barn, in other words, is always filled with plenty. Right? 
Now, your vats will overflow with new wine. This one's really cool. And this one, honestly, is better than the barns being filled with plenty because a vat overflowing with new wine, when you hear about wine in the scriptures, often it refers to uh, the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And you can correct me on this if I'm wrong. Wine refers to the Holy Spirit. So my vat is going to overflow With new wine. In other words, I am going to have a presence of the Holy Spirit in my life that is overflowing that I can't even contain anymore. These are your uncontainable commodities. It can't even, you can't even hold how much Holy Spirit you will have in your life. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? This is not hard. And as I'm studying this out over years, the Lord's just shown me these. And I told you again, my wife and I test God in every one of these. And He is faithful in every single one of these. And don't forget, on first fruits, The motivation is generosity. That may not be your motivation the first time you do it. But you will get there. If you make this a practice in your life, God will see to it every time. I don't even have to ask anymore. You're just doing it automatically. That becomes your motivation. Now, there is a scripture too, and I don't have it on the screen. I apologize for this. But I'm personally going to say this. And it's it. Let me just give you. It's it's First Timothy five seventeen. When it comes to finances and money, and I'm glad I'm giving this sermon today and not Pastor Buddy because I have no problem saying this. Not to say he would, but I personally believe that pastors in a church should make more money than anybody else who goes to that church. They should be the most well paid people out of anybody else in in, in the congregation, right? Now, 1 Timothy 5.17, I'm going to read that for you, and I'm basing that off of this. It says, The elders who perform their leadership duties well are to be considered worthy of double honor. And this is out of the Amplified that I'm reading. It says double honor, and it has a principle, financial support, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching the Word of God concerning eternal salvation through Christ. So, when you give... A first fruits offering. And let me, you know, I forgot to say this. These four types of giving, three of them are given to God, and one of them is given to man. Tithe is given to God. First fruits is given to God. However, first fruits, I believe, can be given directly to your church or directly to your pastors. And I believe God has no problem with that because of that scripture right there. First fruits can be given to the church or it can be given to your pastors directly. And nobody needs to know about it. Now, with that said too, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later too, when you're giving to God, you can do that as openly as you want to do it. God never talks about giving to Him in secret. When you look in the New Testament, they gave in front of the whole... This is why we have a plate at the front of our church, right? Right? Everybody can just give right here. We don't need to pass it around the congregation. I don't have to do it in secret. But when you look in the New Testament, right? Ananias and Sapphira, they were standing in front of the congregation when Peter said, Is that what you got for your property right there? Yep, that's what we got. Bam! Dead. (laughs) Everybody got to see what they gave. Everybody. There's nothing weird about giving a tithe in public or giving to God in public. God completely intends for us to do that. And it's totally fine. I mean, you can give in secret if you want to, but God totally intends. There's nothing wrong with giving in public also to the Lord. So we have the tithe and we have the first fruit. The third type of giving is what the Bible refers to as alms. And that is the one where we do not give it to God, but we give it to man. Okay? Now, this is the one that really gets mixed up with a lot of us. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Let's look at almsgiving and what the Lord has to say about almsgiving. This is the New Life version right here. It says, Be sure you do not do good things in front of others just to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to the poor, in other words, when you give to man, do not be as those who pretend to be someone they are not. They blow a horn in the places of worship and in the streets so people may respect them 
For sure I tell you, they have all the reward they are going to get. When you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand gives. That is what Jesus talks about when he says giving in secret. Your giving should be in secret. There it is. Then your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, what I just said about giving in public, that's giving to God. When you give to man, you do that in secret. Why do you do that in secret when you give to man? For the dignity of men. You do not expose that. And God's very serious about that. Because he even tells you, when you do that, if you make that public, you already have your reward. So what's my motivation for giving alms? The motivation for giving alms is compassion. Right? I just give because I'm compassionate. And I see that somebody has a need and I give to them. And that is a biblical way of giving. So it is something we absolutely should do. And we're setting up here, you'll see, but we're setting up a foundation right here. We have our tithe, we have our first fruit, we have our alms as well. So my uh, motivation behind giving alms is compassion. Now, what's the rate of return for an alm giving? Well, if you blow your horn, you already have your return, and that's your mouth, whatever you said. <laughs> but, and again, I should have had this, but Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. This is again where it says, oh, this relates to that. Got it. Proverbs nineteen seventeen. Out of the message, it says, mercy to the needy is a loan to God. In other words, when I give to the needy, that's like a loan that's given to the Lord. And God pays those back, pays back those loans in full. In other words, God's going to pay you right back what you gave. One to one. That's your rate of return. God will pay you back exactly what you gave to the poor. You get reimbursement, in other words. Unless you want to blab it, right? And God really had to deal with me on that one. Because... My wife and I, boy, he put us so perfectly together. I am an open book, and she is a complete closed book. (laughs) And she has had to teach me how to shut my mouth, as just as I've had to teach her sometimes to open it. And there are many things that we need to shut our mouth on, and this is one of them. I don't need to blab when I give to somebody else. You may may be... let me say this too. When you give, I know the Bible often talks about giving to the poor. And we, yes, we can take that literally. But you give to another man based on how God calls you to give to that man. It, it may be somebody, because you can sit there and have an argument if you want to. And say, but they don't need it. If God's prompting you to give to somebody, give it. Yes. Don't do it. You may be, you've heard this before, you may be in a drive through And you'll just get a prompting. You know what, pay for the person behind me. Just do it. They don't need to know who you are. You may be sitting in a restaurant. You know what? I'm going to pay those people's bill over there. Tell the waiter. They don't need to know who you are. Just do it. It's done out of compassion. It's done by a prompting of the Lord. However, what I said earlier is that this, uh, this type of giving can be confused. Because a lot of times, people will say, well, I took my tithe and I gave it to this cause, or I gave it to this person or something else instead. You know what? Ooh. This is... I had a family member in need, and I gave it to them instead. You better watch it, because now you're crisscrossing these givings, and you can't do that, because the first one that's giving, remember Abram, right? Very first, I gave a tenth to the Lord, because that's what I do. And when you crisscross those... You can't do that because now, okay, I've made alms. I've made my tithe alms. Therefore, God closes the window of heaven. He can't rebuke the devourer for your sake now. So the devil can get all in your finances, take your money. And I, again, I used to get so frustrated because we would give at times. And there were some times that I found out later we were crisscrossing it. And I went, oh, no. Because I would say to my wife, why is it I am so sick and tired of giving something once and then our car breaks down and every bit of what we just gave goes to our, you know, that we should have seen in return has to get paid off of our car now. Because our car costs $1,000 to get fixed. Well, because, partly because we were crisscrossing at times and not on purpose. The Lord had to show me this. It wasn't like we were doing this on purpose. It's just, again, the ignorance thing. If I don't know, I don't know. But the law still applies, Right? So, when I'm faithful with my tithe, God can open that window to heaven. He's going to rebuke the devourer for my sake. I won't have those holes in my net anymore, right, where the finance seeps through. And I get the full reward from God. 
So you've got to be very careful. And this is one again that I'll say this too. Two things that you will see people in a church leave a church over is relationships and money. Right? Wrong relationships or they got sideways in their finances. And they are out the door that fast just because they don't know. Or they did know and they didn't apply it properly. They didn't just trust God. I have to trust God. I have to trust what he says and I have to believe what he said. I can't do that. And that's why these motivations that I'm talking about are so important. Because the motivation behind doing this really should be where my heart is. And that's where that book, The Treasure Principle, applies again. Okay, the last one. I'm going to wrap up here. The last type of giving. We have the tithe. We have the first fruits. We have the alm. The last one is my seed. And that is pretty much my offering, right? So what is that? That is anything else. After I've given my tithe, my 10%, after I've given my first fruit, after I've given my alm, anything else that I now give to God on top of that is my seed. Okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. This is in Mark chapter 4, verse 8. And you're very familiar with this one as well. Other seed fell onto good soil. As the plants grew and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 times as much as had been sown. Now, I understand that when Jesus was talking about this, this is related to salvation. But all things in the Bible relate. All principles in the Bible relate. Are you telling me that if I sow, you're a sower of seed, right? If I sow healing, can I not reap healing, right? When I sow finance, can I not reap finance? So if I sow a seed of finance, can I not reap? And this one's in red too. Can I not reap 30, 60, and 100 fold as much as has been sown? Do you understand how much that is? That's not like 100 plus. That's 100 times, right? That's huge. So when I start giving on top, and when I said we're setting a foundation... That's what that's doing. When it says all of the seed fell on good soil, the good soil is the ground I've already set. I've set the ground. I've set the playing field with my tithe, my first fruit, and my alms. I have good soil now. That soil is ripe for my seed to hit the ground and start producing. That's why they're so important, and that's why there's order to this. There is a tithe, there is a first fruit, there's an almond, there's a seed. And when all those are set, the seed can hit the ground on good soil, and then God can produce that crop. That produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. So my motivation for giving a seed is faith and reward. This really is kind of the one where I can say, yeah, I'm going to get a lot out of this one. Now, again, that's not why you give it. But I'm giving it out of faith. 100% faith. God, I can put that in the ground. And this is, again, where when, when I do our taxes at the end of the year, and I can see on there, charitable contribution. And I know every single thing we've given to you for the year, I go, whoop, all right, 30, 60, 100 fold on top of that right there. That's what I'm looking for. Your seed, when you give a seed, is the greatest way to total debt cancellation in your life. 100%. You can applaud that, absolutely. You kidding me? 100% debt cancellation in your life? Everybody, we live under such oppression over debtors and collectors. And, oh, I, I'm, I, I had a family member once tell me, I'll always have a card loan. I'll, I'll always have a car payment. I won't. You can have that junk if you want it. I plan on walking in and paying cash for one. Amen. That's right. I'm not, you're crazy. I'm not paying interest on that stuff. Now, it's okay, and I understand. <laughs> but you get to a point where there's total debt cancellation. You're like, Pastor Buddy preached on this years ago, total debt cancellation, Right? And he challenged us as a house. Start giving. Start giving what you want to earn in your life. Not what you're earning right now. Give what you want to. And I, again, I told you, God put me with this woman right over here. And that was dangerous. Because <laughs> I'll call her. There was a time in my life years ago that we had, my company that I had worked for at the time gave a bonus. And within a minute, literally one minute of hearing what that bonus amount was, I heard the Lord say, I want every bit of that bonus. The gross, by the way. <laughs> and I called her. And I said, hey, I'm getting a bonus and this is how much it is. But God told me he wants every bit of it. And she goes, okay. 
You're supposed to say no. Then I can say, God, it's the woman you gave me, right? (laughs) No, she's wide open. And I've heard Pastor Buddy even say in the past, you know, there were years before I even attended this church. This woman out gave most anybody in the church as a single mother of three. Unbelievable. And I today now, since I'm married to her, I told, I think Tom, this last week at the table back there, I get to reap the rewards of what she sowed all those years now. We reap them together, right? That's amazing. That's unbelievable, right? Surest way to stop poverty in your life is sowing your seed on good soil. Just keep that in mind, right? Okay. Last scripture I'm going to give you here. Those are the four types of giving. But I want to give you this last scripture because this is so important. And after Pastor Buddy just taught this series that was so awesome on the unremarkables. Look at Luke chapter 21 verses 1 through 4. This will prove to you that giving tithe in the church was public. Look what Jesus did. Just then he looked up, Jesus, and saw the rich people dropping offerings in the collection plate. Then he saw a poor widow put in two pennies. He said, Jesus, the plain truth is that this widow has given by far the largest offering today. All these others made offerings that they'll never miss. She gave extravagantly what she could not afford. She gave her all. Wow. So Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, give and it will be given to you. Well, how much do I give? It says a good measure. What's a good measure? That was a good measure to that lady right there. And she was an unremarkable in the Bible, right? Never heard about her again. But Jesus called her out to his disciples and said, you see her? She gave more than anybody else in this church. That lady right there did. And she gave her all. So what do I give with God? All. He gets it all, right? I'm all in. God, you get Every last bit of what I do here. Now, I have some questions for you that I wrote down. Do you have to do this? No. You don't have to do anything. I had a grandfather in my life once that told me, Scott, you don't have to do anything in your life but die and pay taxes. (laughs) You have to die and you have to pay taxes. (laughs) Because when you get taxed, let's just face it, you get your paycheck, you work for a company, you don't check comes, money's already gone, right? Right? It's not a payment, it's a jack. (laughs) They took that from you. You don't have to do this. But if you want to see the fruitfulness of God in your life, and you want to manage your finances well, this is the foundation you must base it upon. And it doesn't work any other way. Pastor Buddy told us last week, all is better than some. And you're going to see today, again, on on the financial sheets of the church, you're going to see today how faithful God has been to this house. In a time that was like... God was so faithful, so incredibly faithful. What's your reputation with God concerning your giving? Do I treat God as my waiter or is he my master? What's my reputation with God? You know, this church has a reputation with our landlord. The landlord of this building, when we came here a little over five years ago, we took over this building painted the walls in this church. Some men did built these classrooms on the side here. Amazing. Made it look really nice in here. But this space in this building had always been, or in the past many times, had been rented out to churches. And our landlord had a bad taste in his mouth about churches because he'd been burned by churches financially. Not being able to pay their leases. Having to get out of their leases. But I want to tell you something, this church, Tower City Church, and you can applaud yourself on this because you all are givers of Tower City Church. And let me also say something, too, real quick, that Tower City Church does not have a giving problem in here. People in this house give incredibly faithfully. I I clear the air of that, too. I should have said that a lot earlier. But the landlord of this building has told Pastor Buddy, I am so blown away by your church. You have changed my mind on the way church works because of how faithful this church has been to our landlord. You know, God said, Jesus said, pay to Caesar what's due to Caesar. That's the government. That's who you owe money to. You you should be faithful. You shouldn't be in debt with your bills and not paying your bills. You pay your bills and you do it on time. So what's your reputation with God concerning your giving? I'll leave that one up to you. 
Can God trust you with money? Can he trust you to manage the tool of money well? Can you be fruitful and multiply with finances? You don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to worry about how your money's going to multiply or going out and investing in stock markets and all that garbage. Or you can do it if you want, but God's going to be sure you get your return. 30, 60, and 100 fold if you have it set on good soil. And lastly, what's your source? Is God your source? Or is money your source? Who's your source? It may not be money, it may be something else. What's your source? Right? So many times, as the treasurer of this church in the last 11 years almost now, I have seen God bring finance from the outside of this church in. Last month, January 2019, I'll tell you openly, we just had somebody who does not attend this church, doesn't even live in the state of Texas, sent this church a check for $5,000 last month. We didn't go seek it. We didn't ask for it. Just came in. The month before that, in December, another person doesn't even go to this church, never even met this person before, sends a check. This is for the church. God is going to send the money either way. It doesn't matter. Remember, remember the prophet when he went to the brook? God sent ravens to bring him the meat, right? He'll bring it from an outside source. But it's up to us to be obedient and honorable to the Lord to give, right, in Malachi for the storehouse and for the Levites. Amen? Awesome. Why don't you stand with me right now? You know, we have a, um, an awesome class that is on our website, um, and it's called Money Matters. And some of you may have gone through it, and you're welcome to, to tap into it. It's a, it's a class of how to manage your money. And it goes over different principles of giving. And uh, it is a great tool and a great source that you can use there. But I want to ask you today, just as we're getting ready to finish up here and worship the Lord. Maybe you need to get right with God on your reputation of giving. Or, maybe you are giving faithfully. And like I said... This church does not have a giving problem at all. Don't, don't think that by any means. Maybe you have been faithful with your giving. And you haven't seen that return like God promises. And you need to go get your seven times back. Because the enemy's stolen from you. And if that thief is caught today, he owes you seven times. And let me tell you something. God has absolutely no problem with you having money. <laughs> he loves it. You know, as Christians, we should really be the richest people on the planet, right? We should have the best relationships on the planet. So I want to encourage you today. Honor God with your giving today. And come forward. If There's going to be a team. Our ministry team is going to come up here. We'll have a healing team also set over to our side. You guys can come forward now if you'd like. But if you need to get right with your God, with God concerning your giving, give. Get before the Lord today. But also, if you've been stolen from and you just found it out and you have that good foundation set, come forward. And we'll pray with you. I'll be glad to pray with you. And we'll get this right. And we'll see to it that the enemy's found out. Because you are due seven times. And you get furniture in it too.